Hello. Welcome, everybody. Nice to see you all. I'm really happy that you're here. Welcome to the people online. Welcome to the people seated here with me. My name is Jess. My pronouns are she, her, and I'm on the pastoral team here. And as we just allow ourselves to settle in here today, allow yourself in your body to recognize that you're here for a purpose, I'm just going to invite us all to be reminded why we gather. We gather to observe Sabbath. Our feet are grounded here in Mokinstis on Treaty 7 and Métis Region 3 lands. We gather to connect with God, with ourselves and with each other, because Jesus taught us that the practice of sharing the word and sacraments in community matters. And we believe that the very image of God expresses itself in each one of us here, and the Holy Spirit calls all of us to belonging in her church, which is the body of Christ. And so wherever you are at on your faith journey, whatever your race, your relationship status, your gender identity or expression, your sexual orientation, your combination of disabilities, abilities, and resources that you bring with you here, you are not only welcome here, but you are valued. And so today we're actually going to start off with our kids moment right off the bat because I was hoping that um, I could show the kids a few things about our Lent in a bag and our bring the Alleluia situation. So come on up kids, I'm going to need your help. If you feel comfortable, come on right up. And we're going to do a new memory verse for Lent because this is the first Sunday of Lent. And so I thought maybe you guys could help me teach the adults the memory verse for our opening prayer today. So yeah, why don't you find a spot up here and I, th make sure you can see what's on the table because I have some things to show you, okay? So we have this. Did anyone get, did anyone get this last week, Lent in a bag? No? Okay, so right here, Alice has very nicely made this little pathway for us. So you might have done this last year. We did this last year, this tradition, and we're bringing it back this year. So these little rocks, there's 40 rocks. And then there's, this one has seashells, but most of the bags this year have clear marbles. So those are for the Sundays. So we've got here, we've got like Ash Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So that's how far we are. And then this would be the rest of Lent. And then we would put, by the time we put them all out, then we get to the candle because Jesus is the light of the world and then we're going to light the candle on Easter Sunday. All right? Yeah. If, if you remember later you can ask, okay? So I wanted to make sure that you knew about Lent in a bag and there's, if you don't have your Lent in a bag stuff from last year and you need a new bag this year or if any of the adults want a Lent in a bag, they're on the kids table so just pick one up on the way out. So that's Lent in a bag. Do you, do you notice anything else odd on the table today? Oh. Black stuff. Black stuff. Oh, well, it is ashes. 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 So, so Lent is 40 days long. Does anyone know what Lent means? <gasps> Excellent. The 40 days before Easter. Very good. What's that? Yeah. 40 days. If your birthday is five after your birthday, Easter is five days after your birthday. Is that what you're saying? Very exciting. Okay. So these are ashes because the beginning of Lent is marked by a day called Ash Wednesday. And today is not Wednesday. Easter, the bunny often gives people treats on Easter. And the reason why the bunny comes and gives you treats on Easter, do you know why? Because bunnies like to have lots of babies. So lots and lots and lots of babies, and babies are a sign of new life. And Jesus came back from the dead on Easter Sunday, right? And so new life, that's what we're celebrating. So that's Easter. The bunny part is at Easter. But if you back up 40 days to Ash Wednesday, that's the ashes part. And I know Wednesday's already passed because we're on Sunday today. But, you know... We just decided we'd do Ash Wednesday and first Sunday of Lent all together. So ashes here. You get the sign of the cross on the forehead to remind you that you were made out of dust and 
you <laughs> with that, that God formed people out of the dust of the ground. So from dust we come and to dust we will return, but we are held by God the whole time. All right, last thing. We have a, sorry, second last thing, butterflies. So Lent is a sad time, a little bit, because we are looking forward to the time when Jesus is going to, we're, when we're remembering Jesus dying, and that's really sad. And so the Alleluia is something we say when we're excited and we're praising God. So in Lent, we don't say the Alleluia. We bury the Alleluia. So we're going to make these butterflies. We're going to put the butterflies in the cocoon, close it up until Easter, okay? And then on Easter, the butterflies will come out, and they're going to sing songs and stuff. <laughs> All right, so that's the butterfly. So when you get back to your seat, color in your butterfly, cut it out, and then we'll put a stick on it later. And now the last part is the opening prayer. This is the part I really wanted you to help me with with the adults. So opening prayer is up there, and we're going to learn sign language, all right? So can everyone make an L with their hand? Good. L, good. All right, so the L is for Lord, okay? So we're going to do... Lord, like this, Lord. So the Lord is a refuge. Can you do that? That's right. Yes, we did do some actions before. Yeah, and this is a new one. So this is from Psalm chapter 9, verse 9 to 10. So you say it after me. The Lord is a refuge. Awesome, you guys are so good at this. For the oppressed. So the oppressed is like this. It's a person and they're being hurt and oppressed. So the Lord is a refuge for the oppressed. Can you say that? For the oppressed? For the oppressed. Good. Okay, the next one, I'm going to say it and then you go after me. A refuge in times of trouble. A refuge in times of trouble. Good. Those who know your name, this is name, those who know your name have put their trust in you. So it's like we're holding a rope. Yeah, that's it. Let's do that line again. Those who know your name have put their trust in you. So we're trusting in God. Last line here. For you, O oh Lord, good, have not, oh, just a minute, I can't read my drawing here. <laughs> oh, have not forsaken, this is forsaken. Have not forsaken, good, those who seek you. So seek is like you're calling for someone. It's a talking seek instead of a seeing seek. Yeah. Very good. Should we say it one more time all together, maybe? Okay. The Lord is a refuge for the oppressed, a refuge in times of trouble. And those who know your name have put their trust in you. I did. You're right. I forgot that part. For you, O oh Lord, have not forsaken those who seek you. Thank you for helping me with that. All right. You can go back to your seats now. All right. Okay. It is time for our scripture reading. So I'm going to invite Blaze to the front for that. This is a reading from sections of Genesis 6 to 9 from the Message Bible version. God saw that human evil was out of control. People thought evil, imagined evil, 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 evil from morning to night. God was sorry that he had made the human race in the first place. It broke his heart. God said, I'll get rid of my ruined creation, make a clean sweep. People, animals, snakes and bugs, birds, the works. I'm sorry I made them. But Noah was different. God liked what he saw in Noah. This is the story of Noah. 
Noah was a good man, a man of integrity in his community. Noah walked with God. Noah had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As far as God was concerned, the earth had become a sewer. There was violence everywhere. God took one look and saw how bad it was, everyone corrupt and corrupting, life itself corrupt to the core. God said to Noah, it's all over. It's the end of the human race. The violence is everywhere. I'm making a clean sweep. Build yourself a ship from teak wood. I'm going to bring a flood on the earth that will destroy everything alive under heaven. Total destruction. But I'm going to establish a covenant with you. You will board the ship, and your sons, your wife, and your sons' wives will come on board with you. You are also to take two of each living creature, a male and a female, on board the ship to preserve their lives with you. Two of every species of bird, mammal, and reptile. Two of everything so as to preserve their lives along with yours. Also get all the food you'll need and store it up for you and them. Noah did everything God commanded him to do. The flood waters took over for 150 days. Then God spoke to Noah and his sons. I'm setting up my covenant with you, including your children who will come after you, along with everything alive around you, birds, farm animals, wild animals that came out of the ship with you. I'm setting up my covenant with you that never again will everything living be destroyed by floodwaters. No, never again will a flood destroy the earth. God continued, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and everything living around you and everyone living after you. I'm putting my rainbow in the clouds, a sign of the covenant between me and the earth. From now on, when I form a cloud over the earth and the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll remember my covenant between me and you and everything living, that never again will floodwaters destroy all life. When the rainbow appears in the cloud, I'll see it and remember the eternal covenant between God and everything living, every last living creature on earth. And God said, this is the sign of the covenant that I've set up between me and everything living on the earth. All right, I'm gonna make, I may have to make extra sure that my mic is on since last time I did not do any favors to the Zoom folks. So I got it, Zoom folks, sorry about last time. Uh, we, like usual, are trying to fit, you know, so many pounds into a five pound sack um, because here we are finishing our, up our series on origin stories in scripture and also beginning Lent and hoping to have a meal together. So I'm aiming at 10 minutes, which means 15 minutes uh, at the most. <laughs> Becky, I saw you look at your watch. She's gonna check, check me on that, but we'll see. So origin stories continued, and the, this is the flood story. Thanks, Blaze, for reading that. That's amazing. Uh, the flood is an amazing origin story, and it, it's captivating of the imagination. I'm gonna assume that most of us, after it was read here, that, that wasn't the first time that you've heard it. You probably have some familiarity with the flood story. And if not, hopefully it will inspire you, because there's even more, to uh, read it again and dig into it again and, and, I don't know, watch the Russell Crowe movie or whatever you want to do. Um, it's a good story, and there's all kinds of reflections that you can have on it, and I just have a few. So if you're uh, one of those who grew up uh, in the church going to Sunday school, uh, you probably had this story introduced to you very early, uh, because what's not to love about elephants and kangaroos and wombats all coming two by two into a ship and, uh, and, and wandering around and riding out a storm together uh, before being ushered back onto dry land and safety with a rainbow in the sky provided by God, promising that he'll never flood the earth again. Like, it's a great story. And if you know the story well, you probably also know that there's a bit of a sinister aspect to it that, that we typically downplay, kind of like, you know, the, uh, the, the visit of the Magi. There's a, 
another side to that story uh, that we sometimes downplay, especially when, when connecting with kids, right, and, and telling them the story. Uh, namely, that I, I'm going to be coded because we're all together, that the divine um, in, in the story, if you just read it flat, basically commits a pretty brutal genocide on the entire human race and animals and creation except for one family. That's tough to swallow, tough to know what to, to, to deal with. Even so, I do think it's a good thing that we teach our kids the story because it's a good story. Uh, and, and there's a thousand great reasons why it should captivate our imagination and we should wrestle with the hard stuff too. Uh, it, and that's why, you know, Fisher Price comes up with Noah's Ark story. It's just good. And, and I remember when, when we first merged two churches to become the road, we had for the longest time a, a, a mural of, of Noah's Ark there that was really beautiful. Um, we sing, the Lord told Noah to build him an arky arky, right? <laughs> Anyone? You've heard that? So, and we have movies like Evan Almighty, that's a good one too. Uh, all kinds of stuff. I love it all, but there are some cautions. So I do want to point out a couple of, you know, grown-up observations, and I'm going to end with the most important one. Grown-up lessons, I have six in total. They're going to be really short, and I'm going to end with the most important one. But first, I do want to own the fact that I, just me, you don't have to agree, I don't take the Noah story as presented in Genesis to be literally historical. You're free to think I'm wrong, uh, and that's fine. So, and I don't want to say too much about that, but some people say, well, well, then how do you approach an origin story? So I'll tell you how I approach an origin story like this. For me, I would look at a story like this and say, wow, this is an ancient story. It's very, very deep. It's thousands of years old. It's thousands of years older than the book of Genesis itself. It shows up, the idea of a universal flood shows up in all kinds of different cultures, in different religious texts, in different cultures, and no doubt it's rooted in something that happened, right? It's, it's, it's a deep, old story. But, like usual, and this is how I approach it, this story in scripture, like a lot of the origin stories in Genesis, they're not so concerned with what happened on a particular Tuesday afternoon at 2 p.m., thousands of years ago, as they are concerned with telling the truth about who God is and who human beings are and how we ought to live in response. To me, that's the key. That's what an origin story is actually about. So again, in my opinion, only my opinion, no thus saith the Lord coming here, if you think uh, the literal historical view is important, there's a lot of work you need to do. <laughs> There's a lot of challenges. Uh, like, that means these events would have happened at about 2500 BC. So you need to deal with things like the age of the earth, how long human beings have existed, the diversity and geographical distribution of human beings, as well as animals, as well as plants, uh, the genetic diversity of humans that are alive today, the geological record, the archaeological record. But even if you handle all, all of those, and those are tough, and people do, but even if you handle all of those, the biggest problem is the theological one, I think, that I already mentioned. What do you do with uh, an image of, or a presentation of the character of God that kind of wipes out all life, right? Uh, not to mention the fact that there's the, the plan doesn't work out. So literally 10 seconds after, it's not 10 seconds, but you know what I mean. Literally 10 seconds after the flood happens, the world is cast into the same problem that caused God to create, to do the flood thing in the first place. So it didn't work. Uh, and God would have known that, right? Uh, the, the, the same problems and, and conditions happen again. Anyway, there are many people who have better degrees than me, that are committed to explaining these problems. So again, <laughs> you're welcome to think I'm wrong. But from my perspective, uh, the problems with answers in Genesis-type responses isn't that they take the Bible too seriously. In my opinion, they don't take the Bible seriously enough because, it, because this is about truth more than it's about what happened at 2 o'clock on a Tuesday afternoon. And 
and, and there's an assumption almost that, that the Bible writers aren't that bright or something because, uh, y- you know, people will say like, well, uh, it, like Blaze read, right? There's, there's one, one reading that says, well, it was 150 days. But wait a second, wasn't it, if you know the Arky Arky song, <laughs> it was 40 days and 40 nights. So which one is it? And then you get all kinds of biblical scholars kind of explaining, well, how it makes sense that both work. But it's not like that assumes like the Bible writers didn't know Notice that they were too daft to know. Of course, they noticed that. They just don't care about the same things that we care about as post enlightenment rational people who need to get things exactly right in a literal historical kind of view. They're thinking about something way bigger like who's God? Who are we? How do we live on this earth? Okay, so fair enough. Uh, and, and when you get, by the way, to that thing in particular, like the, the, whether it's, you know, 150 days or 40 days and nights, well, why is it 40 days and nights? What if you start asking those questions and then you start thinking, wait a minute, that sounds familiar. The, the people of Israel, when, when they're, they're uh, created by God, given into new creation, how long are they in the desert? Oh, it's 40 years. When Jesus starts his earthly ministry, he's, cast, he's into the desert where he's tempted by Satan and all the rest of it. How long? For 40 days and 40 nights. That's the thing that ought to catch our attention and that we ought to be digging deep into more than whether it was 40 or 150, in my opinion. Okay. So my question and my hope with these six quick lessons that I'm going to go over is what is the thing that, you know, when we're all sitting at grandma or grandpa's knee, mom and dad's knee, uncle and auntie's knee, and and we're being told a story, why are they telling us this story? What is it that they want us to get? And this is hard to do, especially in my allotted 10 slash 15 minutes, because if Cain and Abel is like four lines and it's inspiring of 400 sermons, this is four chapters and there's at least 4,000 sermons that you could get out of it. So this will just be a couple of prompts for all of us to think about, hopefully, meditate on and chew on a little bit. So lesson one, God grieves sin. According to N.T. Wright, a scholar, theologian, the saddest verse in the entire Bible is the first verse that Blaze Uh, read from the message. When God looks at creation that he has made and he grieves what he has made, he grieves what's gone on and what's happened with people that he made to flourish and our brokenness breaks his heart. (sighs) That's lesson one to think about. Lesson two, see it goes quick. God affirms creational diversity and order. Isn't it amazing that that God calls and mentions all these different aspects of creation and says, yeah, they need to be part. They all need to be part of what I'm going to do again. They need to be a part of it. And so do human beings. Uh, They're they're all a part of his love and care as he's going to reboot creation. Uh, Lesson three, Noah listens to God in the face of adversity and peer pressure. And that's probably the, 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 the one we hit home hardest uh, as when, when we're in Sunday school, right? That's the thing we probably learned about as kids. Here's Noah. He's building this boat in the middle of nowhere. Everybody's laughing at him. And, and, but Noah's listening to God. He's heard the voice of God, and he's going to be faithful. And so he's a picture of Jesus in that way. He's going to be faithful. He's going to be obedient. He's, he's going to urge his neighbors to also tune in to the voice of God because of love. And, and, and yeah, it's a, it's a, a image of Jesus' faithfulness. And so the, you know, this is the same lesson that, you know, your, uh, your mom tells you when she says, uh, uh, like, like, don't just go along the, with the crowd. Discern what's right. Uh, if all your friends were going to jump off of a bridge, does that mean it's a good idea? No, it's not. It's a good lesson, right? It can be used the wrong way if we're stubbornly insisting on something that's not a good idea, that's not from God, um, at the expense of everybody else. That can happen too. But anyway, okay, less, lesson four, track with symbolism. Uh, Like the 40 days and 40 nights, I mentioned it earlier, but that's a good thing to meditate on. If you're a person who does meditate and chew on scripture, what what does it look like for you in that 40 days in the desert, in that 40 days with Jesus, 
in uh, or the 40 days with Jesus in uh, fasting and praying? What does it look like to be cramped up in a boat for 40 days awaiting for God to do something new? Do you experience that in your life? Being in, in a desert place or being in a, in a contained place where there's no land and, and your mobility is restricted to ask what God are you doing? What are you trying to bring forth out of my life? What new creation are you trying to bring about? Uh, lesson five is also really track with symbolism. The symbolism is amazing. So I'll tell you my favorite part of the symbolism. Why in the story does God destroy the world with water? Why water? Why not fire like Sodom and Gomorrah? Why not disease? Why not a army, band of angel armies or something like that? Why is it water? Wash clean. Wash clean? That's good. That's good. Anybody else? What's that? Baptism? Baptism? There. Okay. Yeah. So in scripture, what does water represent? Water represents right from the beginning, throughout the entire Old Testament, you read all the Psalms, water and the seas, you know, the seas have lifted up against me and the waves rage against me. Water always symbolizes death and chaos and uncertainty and the unknown. And, and the sea is deep, dark, and mysterious. There's Leviathan, there's all kinds of crazy stuff. It's, it's representative of all of that stuff. And so when creation happens in Genesis 1, creation happens when God separates the water so that land and life can come forth. And here you have the undoing of creation when land now gets swallowed back up by death and chaos and the water. It's the undoing of creation. So new creation is what emerges after being plunged into chaos and re-emerging from the waters. And like Hamver said, that should start to ring some bells for us about big themes in scripture. So first, before our, our baptism that we practice now, let's say you have a story in the beginning of Exodus that God hears the cries of the oppressed in the land of Egypt, and he wants to make out of these not a people, a people. He wants to create them. How does he do it symbolically? Well, he brings them through the separating waters, which is the Red Sea. The waters separate, they emerge through, and they are a new creation. And in case we miss it the first time, it gets doubled down on in the book of Joshua when after their 40 years in the desert, they cross through the, the waters of the river of Jordan. He's recreating his people and bringing them into the promised land. And that's when we say, hmm, I wonder if there's any Christian symbols that have to do with being recreated, washed clean, and made new and new creations out of water. And of course, it's baptism. Jesus called his own death and resurrection the baptism that he must go through. And when we are baptized, we, I, we enact our identification with Christ and going down into death and chaos and uncertainty and destruction with Christ. We also say that with him, we come out of the chaos of sin and death to new life. And it's in almost every song we sing about. Or we could think about our new life in Christ as being those who step out of an ark where we've been contained for a long time into new ground. And for the first time all over again, we have a, a, a ground to stand on and there's a rainbow in the sky and we hear the voice of God saying through that and with that rainbow, I'm for you and not against you. You don't have to fear me because I love you and I'm for you. And that brings me to the very last lesson, lesson six. And again, I should say, I want to say, I've made too many disclaimers, just one more. You do not have to agree with me. Uh, but I don't actually think that the divine knocked out uh, all humans and animals and plant species with the exception of Noah and his family. In fairness, I don't think that the authors of Genesis thought that either. To me, that picture of 
a, a tyrant a little bit uh, is a necessary, is, is pretty much, it's a literary setup. And it's kind of, if you were just looking at it as literature, you'd be like, yeah, it's a literary setup for the story that's going to reveal the exact opposite is actually true of God as revealed in the rest of scripture and as revealed in the person of Christ. Namely, the covenant that God makes with humanity after the flood, that's the heart of God and that's the point of the story. And in that covenant, God says to human beings, after it's all said and done, after the regret, after everything is wiped out and it starts again, and it's about to go back into the exact same chaos as it was before, God speaks to new humanity and he says, my goodness, you human beings are a sinful lot. You sometimes seem totally bent on your own destruction. It seems like Living with, at enmity with me and one another and all creation is, is, is like a hobby or a sport. You just rush to it so, so quickly. And with the earth that I provided for you. Even so, never, ever, ever, never will I respond to your endless penchant for rejecting me with destruction. Because I love you and I don't want to destroy you. I love you and I want to redeem you, and I want to draw you in relationship to me and with me. And I'll never quit on my quest to do just that. I will always be about that program, no matter what you do, no matter what you say, no matter how you stray. That's my promise, that's my covenant, that's my treaty, and I'll sign it with a rainbow, so that every time you see it, usually after the water comes, and maybe the rain makes, if especially if you live in Vancouver, makes you nervous about how you stand with me because it keeps happening again and again. But don't worry, every time you see that re rainbow, be reminded that I am with you, I'm for you, I don't hate you, I love you, I'll never leave you or forsake you. And if you'd like, you can even see that rainbow like an archer's bow, because that's what the text seems to imply, that's pointed not towards earth, but toward heaven, to tell you that I would rather harm myself. I would rather harm myself than to harm you. And I'll show you just how true that is when you meet my son Jesus, who'd rather die at your hands than exact vengeance from you. And that, to me, is the gospel right there in the origin story, right there for us to live into. That's the heart of the origin story as I read it. An ancient story that does, by the Holy Spirit, exactly what origins stories are supposed to be. Tell us who we are, tell us who God is, and inspire us with how to live accordingly. So in a moment, we're going to celebrate that, that we do live and we die, that we suffer and we thrive, but that all of our living and dying and everything else is done in the context of God's stubborn and persistent and never failing, I will never let you go kind of love, the same love that's revealed to us in Jesus. Let's pray together. God, we thank you for your grace, and we thank you that We've had this opportunity as a, a community to look at and, and wrestle with these origin stories and that are complex and deep and old and, and say so much and to unpack them in different ways. God, I pray that you would be with me, with every one of us here as we um, go into our weeks and months ahead to, to continual, continually circle back and wonder and dream and ponder what these stories mean to us. And especially, Lord, help us to tie them to Jesus Help us to tie them to your Holy Spirit that's always drawing human beings who you love into relationship with yourself. And God, may we be among those, and may we be among those who celebrate that good news that you will never leave us and forsake us, and that you come to us even when we're running in the opposite direction. So God, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. stay with me or you can sit down it's up to you 
So today is on the first Sunday of Lent, rather than on Ash Wednesday, that we will be doing the imposition of the ashes. And it's traditional to begin this time with a confession of sin. And the things that, that matter most in life, that those big, huge existential questions, who is God, who am I, why is the world so broken, why have I been a victim but also an oppressor, um, that the, the things that lie in paradox, it's good to remember that the confession of sin is one of those things. Um, there is a knowing when we hear that verse that God saw the world and was grieved. When I hear that, there's almost like heaviness in my body where my feet feel stuck to the ground knowing that I've had my part in that. Um, but in many Reformed churches, they do a confession of sin every week. And one of the things that the, the Reformers taught back way back 500 years ago um, was that it doesn't have to be a thing about despairing over our sin, uh, the confession of sin. It can actually be seen as a conversation with God, as an act of worship in and of itself. What is meant to be is an, ad, an admission of what is, an admission of our humanity, and then the other part of that, the other part of what is, is God's grace that meets us there. And so um, I would just invite you, if you'd like to stand, I'd invite you to join me and we'll pray this confession of sin together. Just, in, just one second here. There we go. Most holy and merciful God, we confess to you and to one another and to the whole communion of saints in heaven and on earth, that we have sinned by our own fault, in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, mind, and strength. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. But please... But please, Father, do not leave us in sorrow. Restore to us the joy of your salvation. Bind up that which is broken. Give light to our minds, strength to our wills, and rest to our souls. Amen. Lord God, you have created us out of the dust of the earth. Bless these ashes, and bless all of us who ask for your forgiveness. May these ashes be a mark of our repentance. Guide us as we walk this Lenten season in preparation for the joy of Easter, and we ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So if you would like to come forward for the ashes, we can just come forward in two lines like we do with communion, and we will just put a mark of the cross on your forehead, and we will say to you, remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. And if you, the kids are done their butterflies and would like to bury their Alleluia butterflies into the cocoon, um, kids, you can bring up your butterfly and put it inside the cocoon, okay? So, uh, will you stand and uh, as I bless us in this benediction? So, beloved, remember that you are dust and to dust you will return. You will die, this is true, and this is true too. God breathed life into you. Imagine goodness for you amid every joy and every sorrow. Beauty is written into your being, grace in every breath, gift in every heartbeat. So go out into the world to love and be loved, to serve and bear witness. Amen. Go. Cool.